I think most of you know who Mary Brunet is. Yes. Um, I know. I was going to say, I don't think there's uh, anyone in here that don't, I don't know. If you know, this is Mary Brunet, good member of First Parish, um, owner, operator of Back in Motion, um, going to talk to us about balance and fall. I keep saying fall protection, but I mean prevention. Yeah, fall prevention. And, um, kind of the same thing. Kind of the same yeah. thing. Talk to them loudly and um, ask her lots of questions. And also, um, just quickly, I'm going to pass this sign up around. Um, Back in Motion is um, interested in, <clears throat> we could have a series of classes here in our room or downstairs, um, maybe once a week, four weeks, six weeks. We could do a series of classes with exercises and things that would help us with our balance and our core strength. Um, but I don't want to commit to that with Mary and her staff if nobody's interested in really coming. So um, this is the sign up. I'm going to have it available, pass it around. Um, if you want to come, I'll sign up just so that I know how many people are interested. I know that we're missing a lot of people this morning, but I'll make some phone calls. We'll get it figured out. So Mary's going to talk. Mary, take it away. Okay. So yeah, so if you can't see, if you guys, you know, or if you can't hear me, just let me know. This is obviously very informal. Um, and my whole purpose in being here today is to give you more information and awareness about the possibilities of falling and then also helping provide you with ways that you can do things to help prevent that for yourself. So the things we're going to be going through today is who is most at risk for falling and why. The other is four quick tests that I'll ask you to participate in if you're willing to today to see where you are with those things. And that will help you to determine your balance and your risk factor right now today. And then the other is things you can do to help prevent falls at home. Uh, the last pay, two pages are a home fall prevention checklist and other things you can do. So we'll go through those, but you can literally take that home with you, go around your house, look for any of those things that could predispose you to increasing your chances of falling. Okay? So at any point, if you have a question, just stop me. I don't mind. Because I'm here for you, not for me. And the more you get out of it, then obviously the better it is. So, okay? So the first thing we're going to talk about is who is at risk for falling. One of the factors, unfortunately, is age. Okay, so if you're over 65, raise your hand. Okay. I'm the baby, I'm sorry. One out of three people over the age of 65. And then if you're over 80, it's one out of two. So it's like look at the person to the right and to the left. So that's how significant it is. That's why there's much more out there now there's much more of a push towards awareness one of the things when we have patients who come in if they're over 65 medicare requires us to inquire about if someone has fallen now let me go over the definition of falling that sounds kind of funny like are you crazy what do you mean i know what a fall is the definition of falling is even if you trip and catch yourself if you go below table level that counts as a fall. Did you know that? No. no. It does. Because it still makes you more at risk. That is a fall. Now, the good part is if you caught yourself, then your reaction time is good. So that's a good sign. But they count that as a fall. If you go below that height, even if it's like you land on the ground, but you sort of catch yourself, that's still considered a fall by Medicare. Because when we, we ask people during their evaluations, that's one of the things that we, we do look for. Now, if you didn't hurt yourself and you fell once, they're not as worried, but we always are because the thing is, we need to know why. Now, if you tripped over your dog because your dog went crazy and came under your feet, that's a little tougher. Hello. Um, so that's a little bit different because obviously you can't 
account for that, okay? But if it's, you know, you're walking along in your house and you trip over something because you didn't see it, that's important. That's a little different, okay? Um, falls are the leading cause of accidental injury in people over the age of 65. The leading cause. So again, that's why we talk about it so much. And if you're over 75 and fall, you're five times as likely to end up in a long-term care facility for a year or longer. That's a pretty sobering statistic. Why is that? Because when people fall, the two areas they injure most commonly are fractured hip. That is the most devastating. That is the one because it limits people's ability to get up and around. The other is in their arm. They can fall and break something in their arm. Now, if you break something in your arm, you can still get up and move around. So you're more physically able, so you're getting exercise and you're getting activity. If you have a fractured hip, you have to be immobilized and you're not, it's not as easy to get up and get around. And if you already had a balance problem, now you don't have the ability to put weight through one leg, what do you think that does? Make it easier or harder? Much harder, so you're less likely to get up as often, less likely to get that activity. So that's why that can be a little bit more of a dwindling spire, okay? So aren't you glad you invited me here today with all this great news? <laughs> Sheesh, no one's, everyone's gonna run from me every time they see me now, so. Um, and the other thing is, this is the last one. Someone who has already fallen once is more at risk. So how many of you have fallen once or are willing to admit you have fallen once? Okay. Oftentimes the reason that happens is fear. If you've fallen once, are you as confident with everything that you do now? Are you second guessing when you take that step and you're not quite sure where your foot is? So you tend to allow that fear to become your leading factor. And that in itself can then cause you to be less active, which causes you to be less able, which again. So all those factors together can put you at more risk. So what can we do about it? We're gonna find out. The other things that do affect us though are things that change with age that we, we can't control, but we can be aware of. First one, Prescription medications. Prescription medications, how could those affect our balance and cause us to fall? What would they do potentially? Dizziness. Dizziness because of side effects. I mean, when you watch those commercials on TV for other prescription medications, the ad is about 10 seconds for what it does and then it's about 30 seconds of all the side effects, including the thing it's trying to change. That always cracks me up. It's, you're taking a medicine for anti-dizziness and nausea, and one of the side effects is it makes your dizziness worse. It's like, oh, okay, well, that's great. So, um, yes, it does. Um, one of the medications most commonly given and can have that side effect is high blood pressure medication. That can be one of the ones that can cause you to have dizziness. So if you, this is what I want you to be aware of. If you are put on a medication and you start to notice you're feeling some dizziness, it's really important to call your physician right away. And the reason is when they put you on a medication, the dosage that they put these ladies on would be a little different than the dosage they're going to put him on. Why would that be? Your weight, your body weight, your physical mass, but they're guessing. You may be more sensitive to that medicine than, or you know, you may be more sensitive than they are and they put you on a high dose and all of a sudden you're starting to feel some weird things. Don't ignore it, call the doctor. They can adjust your level of medication so that you don't have that as a side effect. That's really important because a lot of times people ignore it and go, oh, I'll probably just get used to it. That's not always true, and the physician can't help you if they don't know about it. So make sure you do let them know if you're noticing that, um, rather than just stopping the medicine, because that's not always great either. So you, know, you need to have good communication with your physician about that. Another one, vision 
changes. How many people go to their eye doctor once a year? That's very important because your vision can change rapidly. And if that changes, that will have a big impact on your ability for depth perception. So when you're stepping up or down a curb or getting in and out of a car, um, and if you're still going up and down stairs, it's the same issue. That especially, you know, there's macular degeneration, there's um, glaucoma, and those things can affect your ability to see in the dark. I think that is always the worst for everybody anyways. Dark, getting up in the middle of the night, and we all have to get up in the middle of the night, right? So you need, one of the things we talk about, and that's on the second sheet, is you need to have a lighted pathway. Not just a light to where you're going. You need to have the whole way from your bed to the bathroom with night lights, you know, in those outlets so you can see where you're going. You don't want to be guessing. Because if you fall in the middle of the night, that's not a great time to be falling. If you don't have something next to you, and we'll talk about that too, keeping something, a phone. If you live by yourself, keeping a phone on a low level so you can get to it if you do fall, if you can't get up. Okay? So vision, very important. Get it checked. Or if all of a sudden you notice you're starting to have trouble with your vision, go to the eye doctor. Because that can be something they can remedy relatively quickly if that's part of what's going on and that's important for you to, to get handled because you can handle that, okay? Coordination and reaction time. We talked about that a little bit before when we said if you catch yourself when you fall. But if I challenged you to a coordination test like, you know, I'm going to do this kind of thing, who do you think would win? The youngest person. It's usually the younger person or the person who does that all the time, right? This is one thing that a lot of people as they get older don't know. They assume that as they get older, everything deteriorates. Well, they have done studies to show that if you keep working on increasing your strength, if you keep working on increasing your coordination by practicing it on a regular basis, you can maintain all that. Isn't that interesting? That's why there's, I mean, you read about people all the time. There was a woman and she did like a, a marathon and she's like 86. She didn't start running until she was 70. It just shows you that a big part of it is often up here. And you go to the doctor and you complain about something and what do they tell you? You're just getting older. It's aging. Well, that's not always true. So sometimes it's worth it to challenge that and to go beyond that because they have done again studies about um, like especially this is one women in squatting in third world countries women don't stop squatting their whole life because they do a lot of activities that involve a lot of low level things like whether they're picking plants or carrying things doing a lot of manual work versus in countries like ours They've done research and they've looked at it. And women after the age of 50, many of them stop squatting. They just stop squatting, like going down to the lower cupboard to get pans. Instead of doing this, they start doing this. And the more you stop doing it, it makes it harder to do it. Because then it can become very painful because you haven't been doing it for a while. So then if it hurts when you try to do it, what do you do? Don't do it. And it becomes that vicious cycle. So again, those are things that you do have the ability to change, but you have to work at it. It's not going to happen sitting in a chair, right? You have to actively work at those things to maintain them. So your coordination and your reaction times, you can work on that. Just like, you know how you read now, you can do puzzles, crossword puzzles, um, Sudoku, cryptograms, all those things to help keep your brain stimulated. You can keep your coordination and your reflexes. You know, you can do little reflex games, like little quick activities, or keep a beat, or play some music that has a quick beat to it and keep it. This is, that's what it takes to be able to do that and do that fast, or take up the drums. Join a band. You guys could have the originals. 
band. That's right, Garage Band. They have that on the computers now too, right? We have it on the apps on the phone. I could see it. That would be kind of fun, right? Get out the old electric guitar, air guitar maybe. I don't know. But the maracos or the what are the little, right? Castanets. Those things do though. They take rhythm. Rhythm takes coordination. So all of those things are important. So there are little things you can do, you know, cutting with scissors and doing it quickly rather than try to do it quicker. Follow a line. That's coordination. That's your hand coordination. Your foot coordination is like tapping your foot or we'll do with patients sometimes if there's a step, foot up, foot down, foot up, foot down and see if you can do it quicker without losing your balance, right? That's coordination. Why is that important? Because every time I step, I need to have that coordination. So if I'm about to fall, if my nervous system is able to respond quickly, I have a better chance of protecting myself than having it happen and go, oh my gosh, what just happened, right? So that's why the reflexes and coordination can be very important. So you can do things to keep that or improve that, get that better. So. Um, what's the cup game the kids play too? The, you know, they have the cups and they flip them over and they, they make music with that too. It's a whole cup game and they flip them around. Or maybe we should play beer pong or something. I don't know. Would that work? You know, ping pong? <laughs> something like that. It's coordination and reaction. That's all that is. So there are things you can do or if you enjoy that, those are the kind of things that can help you to do those. Okay, that. The other thing is, and this is where PT comes in as well too, is decreased leg strength. How would decreased leg strength make you more at risk for falling? Right? So you go to get up out of the chair and your legs are weak. You can't straighten up all the way so you lose your balance because you're leaning forward already, right? Or if my legs are weak, what if one leg's weak and the other isn't? What am I going to do? I, I limp, and if that leg, just for one little nanosecond, doesn't kick in the way I need to, it can buckle, right? That can cause me to fall. So your strength in your legs is very important. Having The other thing that can cause problems is your flexibility in your legs. And people don't always, they're not always as aware of the fact that you need to have good flexibility. So, because if you're bending over, if your hamstrings, which are the muscles on the back of your thigh, if they're flexible, they let me bend more. But if they're not, then I have to shift my weight more forward, which is going to make me fall forward. So you don't even think about things like that, that that can enter into it, but it can. That's why we do what we do, which is if someone comes in, we do a full evaluation. We look at all the things that are going into possibly making your problem worse and address those things so that you are doing the things to keep yourself going the right way. And the other big factor, and again, this is really what we see people for, is pain. Where would, could I have pain that might affect my ability to balance and walk and keep myself upright? Your back, knees, where else? Hips, feet. feet. Ankle, all of the above. Shoulder could too, because if my shoulder really hurts and I don't want to carry something on this side and I'm carrying it all on the other side and I'm carrying too much, that could pull me to one side. So yeah, you don't realize sometimes how all those things can impact it. And you know, that is oftentimes we'll get referrals for people for pain and that's what's affecting their balance. So we work on both of those things together because they will both affect, one will affect the other. Your ability to have good balance is affected by your ability to put weight through your legs evenly. If you have pain, that will affect it. So we want to make sure that you have those things that will help keep your balance. So that's why we screen for those things for anybody over 65 in the clinics. Um, so let's do, if you're willing to, you're going to need to pull your chairs back from the table so you have room, because you're going to do this with me. These are the four tests to see if you may be at risk. You can participate if you want. You don't have to participate if you don't want to. That's up to you. But I'll show you what I would like you to do the very first thing. 
So, I would like you to get up from the chair, but before you do it, I want you to watch me. Not using your hands. Your hands can be anywhere but the chair or your body. So that's what I mean by that. And, woo, sitting on the microphone thing here. Woo! <laughs> Gave me a little, I'll put that baby back on there. So, okay. So, not only getting up, but sitting down. What, what's the difference between this and this? What's the difference between those? Control. control. And what gives me control? <laughs> Muscle. Muscle strength. So if I don't have the strength to lower myself, I'll just let gravity, good old gravity, take over and just take me there, right? Sometimes what happens is people out of habit, they don't even realize they're doing it, they start putting their hands on the chair to get up. If you find yourself doing that, you don't want to if you don't have to, because guess what? It will get to a point where you have to because you're not using the right muscles. The hip extensors and the abdominals to get yourself out of the chair. So, if you're willing, if you feel safe, you can do it right in front of the table so you don't, if you fall, you're going to fall over the table on each other. I, I don't know. So. so, go ahead. If you're comfortable doing it, if you want me to stand near you, I will be more than happy to do that. Yep, if you have to hold on, you do. But that's one of the signs that it makes it tough. And then lowering slowly, too. See how you do with lowering. Yeah. I heard a few clunks. <laughs> so you, you know who you are, but that's how you can test that. Because that shows that all these muscles that are controlling that motion are working the way they're supposed to. If not, and you find yourself doing that, one of the tricks you can use, get close to the edge of the chair. Here's the thing, if I'm sitting back this far, I have to use a lot more momentum to get myself up. Come to the edge of the chair, put one foot a little bit in front of the other two, okay? So get close to the edge, scoot towards the edge of the chair, the front of the chair, okay? Can you get closer to the edge? There. Now when you come up, you can go straight up instead of having to go forward. There you go. Little, was that any easier? Yes, no, maybe so. If it is, then that's another little trick you can use, right? Because then it, that doesn't require as much effort. If you like the challenge, sit on your couch and get up without holding on. Because couches, they're low. But if you fall, don't tell anyone I told you to do that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but that's, if you know you can do it safely or there's nothing, you know, in front and you know it and you're pretty good at it, it's a way. Just even doing this, that's a little exercise right there. Practicing getting up and down with control. You can do that, right? You can do that at your kitchen table because you got the table there. So if for some reason, then it's right there. And then the same with lowering and you're just going to go back into the chair. So that's a safe way that you can practice that. If you can do that pretty easily, but you want to do it for a challenge, you increase your repetitions with it, okay? That's one way you can do that to change that. So the other one is, now we don't have stairs here, but I want you to ask yourself this question. When you go up and down stairs, okay? So if I was pretending I'm going up and down the stairs, do you go up? one step and then you bring the other foot up to the same step or do you go up one step and you go past to the next one and past to the next one <laughs> does everyone understand the difference between two so the first we call it step two you take a step you bring your foot to it you take a step you bring your foot to it how many people step like that okay now people do that for various reasons knee pain one of the most common. Or, here's another trick. When you go to go downstairs, do you find yourself turning and going a little bit sideways? That's another cheat. <laughs> That's when you have knee problems and you go, you know, if I just, you don't even realize you're doing it. If I just turn sideways, it's less stressful on my knees. That's a sign that you need to get your knees addressed. Because you should be able to at least do a step two gait, at a minimum, straight forward. If you're doing a step two and going to the side, 
That's the double whammy. So you want to get those things addressed so that you can do it where you're going up and down straight forward. And again, because what we see is people who have knee pain, then they don't use these muscles. That's what you're avoiding when you go up and down the stairs sideways. Then these get weak. That makes your knee pain worse, which makes you go more sideways. Again, the vicious cycle. So we want to stop that and turn it around. Now, if it's because of weakness, then that's something you can work on though too. You can work on your strength of your quads and your hip extensors and your abdominals. These are the areas that will help you to be able to do that in a way to get yourself up and down, just like out of the chair, you have to be able to lift to get up and down with your hips. Same with the stairs and you're straightening the knee. So those things can be addressed. That's what we do in PT is get you doing those things better. And if you have pain, really doing our best to address the pain as much as we can so we can get you as functional as possible, okay? Um, walking. If you're comfortable, I want you to get up and just walk around, take a couple steps, because then I'm gonna have you look at how you're walking. So go ahead and just take a few steps so you know it's your normal walking. If you're comfortable doing that, if you're not, that's okay too. So you're gonna walk around a little bit in the room so you feel like if you were getting up to use the bathroom and you're walking, just take a couple steps. Okay, walk around a little bit. So as you do that, I want you to pay attention to two things. Do you feel like your feet are really far apart? Okay, that's one sign. If you find your feet aren't close together, they're, they're apart and you have to keep them apart to walk. Or are you limping or leaning towards one side? Those two things indicate two things to me. If your feet are apart and that's the only way you can stand or walk, that's a balance issue. We do this because we have a bigger base of support. But if you put your feet together, it's a smaller base, you're more wobbly. That's a sign that your balance is an issue. If you limp, that's usually either weakness or pain in the leg. And that's, again, one of those things that can predispose you to falling or tripping, okay? So you guys, you know, just pay attention to that when you're walking. And now we're gonna, well, before you sit down, if you're gonna do the last one, go to the wall and put your hand on the wall because you're gonna need it, or the chair. And I want you to try to, you can hold on, put weight on one leg, but that's why I have you holding on to the wall or the chair for balance. If you can't do it, and then try to see if you can let go. Don't knock the other over. We don't want dominoes, though, where it goes all the way down. Betty, you can't fall, okay? All right, good. So, but, and then check your other side. Is one side more than the other? But you should be able to at least do this for at least five seconds. That's a minimum. One, two, three, four, five. Other side, one, two, three, four, five. If you cannot, you are at risk for falling because what happens every time you step? You are single weight bearing. It's the same with stairs. Unless you know something, I don't know. Well, that's why people start to shuffle too, right? That's what I'm doing. Well, because then they aren't having to pick that foot up off the ground very long. So they always have two feet on the ground. But that also makes you trip because you're not picking your feet up and you're not lifting it up over things. There's other reasons you can shuffle in that too, but those are some of the things if you see that start to develop, why? So your balance is very important. Is that agreed? Yes. Yeah, yes. huge. And can you change your balance? You can improve on it. That's right. And if you're improving on it, is it deteriorating or getting better? getting better or at least keeping you keeping me upright. That's right. And that is so important because guess what? Mm -hmm. Keeping you upright is one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. Now here's another thing we didn't talk about, but I know it's true. My mom's 89. She lives by herself. Oh, nice. If she fell, do you think she would want to tell any of her children? No. no. Why? Exactly. Everybody's afraid of getting put in a nursing home. Yeah. It's a reality. Let's talk about yeah, it. Right. You know, let's not ignore it. It is a reality. So if I don't tell anybody, 
They won't know, but now I'm afraid. Now every time I'm near them, what do I have to do? I'm performing, aren't I? So now I have that stress of I better look like I'm not, you know, having any problems. So there's that whole stress, so then you don't want to see your family, okay? Some people we just don't want to see our family anyway because of other reasons, but, you know. But is that not true? Yeah. It is a reality because that is your independence. Driving and living in independently. Those two things are your biggest things that keep you going, right? Let you come to these meetings, let you participate and be with your friends. So the threat of that being taken away is one of the things that stops people from telling others. But it's really important because you can get help from that. And that's what I'm here to stress today. And it, you know, the thing is, a lot of times people don't realize physical therapy, first of all, you do not need a referral from your doctor. How many people knew that? All right, good. You do not. You can come right to PT. Does Medicare cover physical therapy? Yes, at least 80%. If you have a supplement, it usually covers the rest of it. Can you come every year to PT, just like you go to your primary care doctor for a physical every year? Yes. Do they tell you that? No. So your balance and your strength, keeping those things, you have a right to keep those. And if you are interested in doing that, you can take advantage of that, no matter where you go because that is your independence. So don't think, you don't have to wait till it gets bad. If you're noticing some of those changes, that's when we wanna see you. We wanna help you to turn it around, you know? And that's why we talked about, you know, doing some classes or having classes for you all so that you're doing those things and that you really have a good understanding of that too, what you can do to prevent that. Um, and this is just from research too. Studies show that balance, flexibility, and strength training improve mobility and reduce the risk of falling. That has been proven with research. So it, it just helps you to keep going. Now this page here, I want you to turn to that because we're going to go through some of these. How much time do we have? 11.30, 11.40. Okay. All right. So the first thing is things you can do, the appointments, we talked about that. Your primary care doctor and your eye doctor. You want to handle those every year. Or if your vision's changing, go to your eye doctor. If you're noticing, even if it's at night that you're not seeing as well, that you're noticing your, what I call depth perception is, if you go to take a step and you're like, whoa, I, I thought that was not as deep, or I thought that was closer to me, that's your depth perception. That's really important. You know, if you're stepping up a little bit of a curb or a little bit of an incline and it looks more than it is, you're going to misstep and that's going to that's going to set your timing off. So those are the kind of visual things you can look for and, and you can have them look at that for you. The second thing, things you can do, exercises to improve your balance, get your legs stronger, and also improve your coordination, okay? Getting up slowly after you sit for a long time or lie down. You know, when you lay down, what happens to your blood pressure? You're at sleeping at night and you get up quickly. My blood pressure when I'm laying down is low. And when I get up really quickly, sometimes it's still low and I get a little dizzy. That's not unusual, but knowing that that happens, I don't want you to be like, woo, right? Because you're just going to keep going. You're just going to be like, all right? So you, you, I don't want you to be a gymnast jumping out of the bed. Even if you need to get to the bathroom quickly, you need to sit there for, you know, get your bearings, make sure your balance is good, and even when you stand up then too, right? Um, if you need to, keep a chair near your bed so that when you get up, so if that is next to your bed, and then you get up, you have it there to catch you because otherwise we only have the nightstand and then there's really nothing else. And obviously we might fall back on the bed, but we could also go forward. So if you have a chair that you can keep near it, that helps you then to make sure you have your balance before you start heading to the bathroom. Okay? A lot of people kind of hold on to the walls or hold on to the furniture too. That's one of the things they'll do. Um, and the other thing it talks about wearing shoes inside and outside the house. Um, Slippers, I mean, a lot of the slippers they have now are almost like shoes. 
So what they're talking about is they don't want you to have the scuffy slippers, the little slip-on ones. Why would that not be a great idea? Exactly, that's why they're called slippers, right? They can be very, whoo, right? You're on a linoleum or tile floor, that can be very slippery. So you want something that has good tread on the bottom, but you also, when you're trying to hold on the little scuffies, you, you're using your toes and your feet, but you're not actually feeling, you're not walking normally. If you have a shoe that's snug on your foot, you're not worried about that, and you're able to put your attention and your motion on using your feet completely so you have better balance. That's why when I talk about slippers, it's really those, you know, the little scuffy ones you don't want. Okay? Um, keeping emergency numbers in large print near each phone. So you have that ability to get to that. Putting a phone near the floor in case you fall and can't get up. Because you, if you fall and you fracture your hip, you can still probably crawl, but you cannot put weight on that. So you want to be able to get to something. You know, having it on a coffee table or a low table somewhere. How many people still have home lines? The li a phone line in your home versus just a cell phone. Yeah. So good. So that's right, because the more you have, the more places you have. And if you have a cell phone, you literally can keep that right next, you know, near you in your bedroom too. Yeah. I know my mom has her little flip top phone. She just doesn't always know where it is because it's little, you know, so. And then the home line too, she's got a couple in her apartment as well too, so. Um, and then if you're really concerned, you need to think about wearing one of those alarm devices because you do not want to be stuck in a stairwell or be stuck somewhere where you can't move and you, no one's coming in the next morning and you're there by yourself. That's really what, nobody wants that. Your family doesn't want that. You know, that's the other thing I find, that um, when we start talking about is it safe to live by yourself, to, you guys can be a little selfish. Did you know that? Because your kids, being a kid, you worry about your parents, you want to give them the most independence possible, but you also want to make sure they're safe. And the thing is, if something ever happened where you were there for a while by yourself, they would be beside themselves. Because they're trying to give you as much independence as they can, but also to make sure you're safe. And you guys, you need to just communicate to each other about that. You need to talk to each other about it. Not talking about it. What does that create? problems, stress on both sides, questions about do they know? Do they know that my balance isn't as good? And then the, the children and they're at work and they're thinking about their parent because they're worried and they better call and check on them, but I don't want to keep calling because then they think I'm bugging them. And you know, so it just creates things that don't need to be there. So you just really need to keep communicating with them. And even if it's calling each other every day to check in and say, hey, I'm doing all right, just wanted you to know, that's great. You know, um, so those alarm devices, if you are, you know, on your own more, then that would be something you might want to consider having if you're living on your own. Things you can do around the house. This is just a checklist of going through, looking at your lights, making things brighter. Um, uniform lighting. Don't have one area that's really bright and then the other areas with the lower lighting where you really can't see. There's lots of shadows because, again, with your vision, it just makes it tougher to see those things in the shadows, and that's when you're more likely to trip over something. Um, you can, if you have a step, then you paint those a contrasting color on the top or the edge so you can see the difference. Don't have your stairs the same color all the way up and down, because then you, that's that depth perception. You know, if you have something, or sometimes people will put tape like fabric tape on the edges of the steps so you know exactly where it is. It gives you visually that ability to know that. Um, that you know, there's a lot of products out there now that are meant for those things. Floors, just keeping things up off the floors. You can look through that. Stairs and steps. Um, if you're using any kind of step to get inside and outside of your house, you really need to make sure, especially outside steps, those can get loose. Those can pull away from the house. You need to make sure you have railings. 
Ideally, you want to have railings on both sides for inside and out of the house, right? Because if you're carrying something, you might need to hold on with the other hand. Um, there's a bunch of other little tips with that. And the same with the kitchen. Keep, if you are in your kitchen and you're vertically challenged like me, do I want stuff way up on the top shelf that I'm using all the time? No. I need to keep everything between here and here. So the, you know, the drawers and the cabinets that are just below the counter, those are good for the things you use the most. The same with the cabinet just above, or the shelf just above the cabinet. Keep all the things you use on a regular basis there so you don't have to be climbing or trying to get down really deeply for things on a regular basis. Unless you feel really comfortable squatting, then you can keep things lower. But if it's something that you know challenges you too much for your balance, then don't keep things there. Bathrooms. Very high incidence of falls in bathrooms. Why is that? Tubs, Tubs are slippery. Are bathroom floors slippery after you get out of the tub? Yes, because there's water. Toilet seats, they're very low if you don't have a raised toilet commode. That is important. So they, you can get things to raise the commode so you aren't having to go so low. And if you're hanging on to like, if you have a sliding glass door and you're trying to hang on to that railing, that's not good. That is not sturdy enough. They do have Actually now, they have the suction handles that go on the walls for the tub, so you have something in the tub. Those are actually pretty good. They have those like, at, they're as seen on TV, you know, they have all those products. It's actually a good one. If you're traveling, going to stay at family's house over the holidays, you want to take some of those because they're not going to necessarily have that. But if you take that with you, I think they're like 20 bucks. Those things work really well. It's just a suction system. And then you have something you can hold on to when you're in the shower. Or take one of your outside plastic summer chairs and stick it in the shower so you can sit down, right? And use the handheld thing. If you're at someone else's house or at a hotel. Now, if you're flying, I don't think you can check a chair, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, I'll let you guys figure that one out. But does that make sense? You really want to make sure your balance is good in the bathroom, in the shower, because that's such a vital area and one of the highest incidences of falls, right? Same with your bedroom then too, we already talked about that. So, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things. Hopefully I didn't scare the heck out of you. That's not my intention. My intention is to make it real, get you to understand why it's so important and that you can do something about it and you can change that. But who's responsible for this person that's in front of me right now. Who's responsible for taking care of that body that you're in there? You, 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 you. That's right. You guys too. No one else can do that for you. You have to reach. You have to take responsibility for that. So if you're aware of it and you know it's an issue, then you can handle it. If you don't even know it's a problem, you're not going to handle it. So that's really why I, I talk to people about it. So they know. And it's so much easier to change it when it's just starting and things are just beginning to happen. But even if not, we can still help you, get you to where you need to be. So, do you have questions? I would love to answer any questions you have about any of this. Huh. You know, there are some reasons why we fall that are accidental. Sure. Guys, for instance. Oh, yes. Me my fall. Anybody can fall on that, you know? That's the thing. Black ice, you can't see that necessarily. And even if you do, sometimes it's too late because you're already on it. So quick. Yes, <laughs> yes. But the thing is, if you fell, the chances are you damaged something, whether it was your muscle, your connective tissue, bruised, your bones and all that. And so when that happens, then you don't use those the same way for a while. And then they don't always come back on their own. Sometimes those muscles stay not as active and then that creates more of a problem down later on. So if you fall, even if it's or you're tripping over the dog, it's still a fall and that can create those problems later because you're not able to do everything the same way. Just like I was talking about, if you had knee pain, back pain, hip pain, you're not walking the same way, I'm not putting as much weight on this leg, this leg gets weaker, more pain, it's that vicious cycle. So. When you, when you have falls, just make sure everything's back to where it needs to be. 
that's important that you feel like you can do everything you did before so well, exercise class helps. I'm in my 10th yeah. year yes I just came from it that's wonderful yeah if you can exercise on a regular basis yeah. that is key it keeps me going yes mm -hmm. yes you Alice keep, keep this up forever when I keep what up forever <laughs> this exercise sure <laughs> <laughs> Yep. You, you, the thing is, what happens when we stop doing things and give up? Exactly. You got it, Betty. It's a reality. We know that. Most people, one of the biggest factors is when they retire, what happens? They, they no longer have a purpose, and so there they go. So, you know, you guys are lucky. You have good friends. You have good fellowship. That's really important. We know that. But obviously for yourself, you need to take care of yourselves so that your friends still have you, right? Key. And, and being able to stay as independent as you can. Believe me, I, you know, I would be the same way. I'm, I'm going down fighting. So the more, you, the more active you can stay, the more exercise, walking, all those good things that you can do to really maintain as much as possible are very important. So, yeah. Yeah, so the more, you, the more you do, the better. I know, I love when i you know, driving around town and that. Sometimes I see people out walking and I literally wonder how they're standing up because there's one person I see and he walks like this. And I'm always like, I'm not sure if his steps are so fast because he's trying to stop himself from falling over, but good for him that he's out there and he's walking because he's keeping himself going. If he gave up and just sat in the chair, you know, I'm sure it wouldn't be good. So he's, he's fighting the good fight, and he's, he's doing a good job. So. Mary and I did also bring a little stack of these free pain consultation cards. So if you do want to come in and get your balance evaluated, we're right around the corner. Um, we always offer these free 30-minute pain consultations. But it's also a balance, balance screen you can do, too. It's not just that. As well. Yeah. Um, but th we have had really, really great results with um, you know, gaining any type of confidence even with, with balance and gait at all three of our clinics. So I know that Mary and I chat about her mom every once in a while and my memory who's in her 80s and we do worry. And you know, if, if you're making that effort just to eat, whether it's build your confidence or make, make your family members a little more comfortable with you being by yourself, it really does mean a lot. And, and you know what, that brings up a good point too, what Tess said. Sometimes you do need to have a cane. That's, you know, every time I think I've had a patient the very first time we've suggested that they need something to walk with. You see the face of, I'm not going to use that for a lot of people. But oftentimes it is just when you're out in public because when you're out in public, especially if you're in a crowd, what happens? You can get bumped into, you get moved somewhere that you normally wouldn't choose to walk. So when you have something with you, and they have so many cool walking sticks now, you know, you see people out with walking sticks all the time, like the cross country ones. Mm -hmm. You can use things like that, uh, it's okay. You know, but you wanna recognize and be honest with yourself that if you need something to help you, that's okay. It's better than falling and having the consequences of that. And that's what that's about. So. We, when we look at people, there are times um, that we will make that recommendation for them then too and help them secure that. Alice has the loan closet. We're always calling her up. Alice, we need to get into the loan closet because there's people who donate things that they don't ha use anymore and it's a great service. So that we rely on that loan closet a lot, let me tell you. Do you have a feeling about the four-prong canes versus the straight cane? Well, the four-prong cane gives you more support. That's, those are intended for people who the straight cane isn't enough. And that's what we evaluate. As a PT, we look at it. We look at your balance. We do. There's several. We call it up-and-go test. And then there's another Tinetti. So we take you through all these coordination and balance tests, and it gives you a score. And then we know from that, and then also looking at you walking without any assistive device, that's a cane or a crutch or a, 
um, four prong cane or a rolling walker. And then if we think you need something, we try the different things. We want to see what's going to work best for you. Because we don't want to give you something you don't need that's way too much, because then that's going to discourage you from being up and around. But we also don't want to give you something that's not enough that really isn't going to help you either enough to prevent you from you know, your fall. So everybody's at a different level, so it depends, and that's what we assess. And does everybody know that Alice's granddaughter, Alex, is a PT now? Yeah. And that she works at Back in Motion? She She's in our Portland office. Doctorate and PT, that's right. So, yeah. Small world. That's right, she does. But if any of you are interested in that, like I said, at any point, that's what we do. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of, no, you're doing well, start doing this exercise. You know, that you'd benefit from this or doing that. It's just to identify those areas that you may not be aware of, maybe a little weak, and then they can get you going on something. Some people need more. Everybody's different, and that's part of what we look at. So, okay? Good. All right. You are welcome.